Good morning, everyone. On Friday, we recognize the Vermonters lost to COVID-19, and sadly, since then, we've lost at least two more. Today, I want to talk to you about one of them, Mary Pat Brown, after an email from her family. Mary Pat was a mother of six children, Elizabeth, Christopher, Michael, Denise, Matthew, and Mary, who she raised in Bristol with her husband. And I greatly appreciated hearing from her family, who clearly loved their mom a great deal. In the email, Mary Pat's family shared their grief, saying, her loss weighs heavy on us, with the worst part being that we couldn't be with her as she struggled to fight this awful virus. Continuing, our family feels that these deaths need to have names attached to them. Maybe, just maybe, it will spark even one person to do better and try harder to follow guidelines for their loved ones and community. This is what would give our family comfort. So I appreciate the Browns' willingness to share their story and for putting a name, Mary Pat Brown, as a very real consequence of this virus. Because these deaths are not just numbers. They're people who love their families, contributed to their communities, and who are no longer with us. My heart goes out to the Brown family and the families, friends, and caretakers of all those we've lost. This is a tragic reminder of why we're doing what we're doing and of why we're continuing to ask for Vermonters to sacrifice, to slow the spread of the virus, protect the vulnerable, and to keep families like Mary Pat's whole. And I know many of you are doing just that. You've stepped up from the beginning and you made the difficult decisions to avoid getting together with family and friends, staying home instead of traveling and wearing a mask when around others. So I want to thank you for your help, even when it's hard or feels unfair, or even when you've disagreed with our approach. I also know there are some who want to do the right thing, but don't quite see the risk in having lunch with a friend, going bowling with people we've known or you've known for years, or having family over for dinner. Maybe you think it's safe because they're good about masking and none of them seem sick or your friend only goes to, goes to work and home so they couldn't possibly have COVID. As Dr. Levine said a few weeks ago, with the amount of virus in our communities right now, even your trusted friends and households are at much greater risk and may not know they have the virus. That's why we place the restriction on gatherings and required quarantine for all non-essential travel. There's also those who just aren't worried about getting the virus. You may be young and healthy. You can work remotely if you need to, or you just don't think it's a big deal. To those folks, I say your actions could hurt others. You never know when you're going to be the domino that leads to a nursing home outbreak or the one who pushes an entire school to remote learning. And with enough of these dominoes, we put our health care facilities at risk. And the fact is, protecting our family and friends is truly in our hands. And we all have a role to play. So I'm asking you to help by avoiding getting together with people outside your households and not travel this week. If we can get through the rest of this year and widely distribute a vaccine, we'll be able to return to some sense of normalcy very soon. Being smart now means we'll come out of this faster and stronger. Unfortunately, we know there will be some who just won't do it. And we'll get together uh, with multiple households this week. Anticipating this, schools have asked for help and how best to deal with this when kids come back to school. So the Agency of Education will be directing schools to ask students or parents if they were part of multifamily gatherings as part of the daily health check. 
And if the answer is yes, they'll need to transition to remote learning for 14 days or seven days in the test, just like they had traveled out of state. Again, we understand how difficult this is. But since we know these types of gatherings have been the cause of so many outbreaks, we've got to do all we can to slow this down. We also strongly advise businesses to consider doing the same by asking employees to quarantine if they aren't adhering to our gathering restrictions. To be clear, this is not meant as a way around the gathering ban. This shouldn't be used as an excuse to get together with other households. The more we adhere to this policy, the faster we'll, we'll, we'll be in lowering the number of cases, and the sooner we'll be able to ease up on these restrictions. I also want to let you know, and the VPA is aware, based on our current data, that unfortunately we'll be postponing the start of school sports, which were set to start November 30th. Like recreational sports, these are paused until further notice, and we'll review it again each week. Again, this is an example of why it's so important to be vigilant and avoid small gatherings, and it's my hope that adults will realize the need to sacrifice in order to give our kids this important time in their life, and most importantly, help keep them in school as much as possible. We spent a lot of time today and over the last few weeks talking about those who aren't following the guidance. So I want to be sure we recognize the many, many more who are doing the right things. While we've seen record growth in recent weeks, we still lead the nation in the lowest number of cases and deaths. And that's because of all your efforts. So I know asking you to sacrifice yet again is frustrating, but there is light at the end of the tunnel and we will get there. The fact is the sacrifice we make today and over the next few weeks, will make sure we get to the end faster, stronger, and in a better position than any other state. So thank you for all you've done and will do to get us there. And I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for our latest modeling data. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start the update again by just putting into perspective uh, some of the recent case growth that we've seen across the country uh, and in Vermont. Um, this week, the country has passed another grim milestone since our last presentation, uh, passing the 12 million case threshold and continuing to do so at a remarkable speed, adding an additional 1 million cases uh, in just six days. To help put this into perspective about just how quickly cases have been growing across the country, um, all of the reported cases from the pandemic, 26% of them have been in the month of November on a nationwide basis. Considering this another way, nationally we have recorded more cases so far in November than the months of March, April, May, and June combined. Similarly, here in Vermont, we've reported over 40% of our total cases so far in the month of November. Again, put it a different way, we've recorded more cases in November than we did March all the way through July of the pandemic. So you get a sense of just how quickly cases have been going up, both nationally, but also here at home. You can see on the seven day average that cases continue to trend up. We're just under 170,000 cases per day uh, on average across the United States. And all of this is happening on the doorstep of the holiday season. So this resurgence really could not come at a less inopportune time. Throughout the pandemic, a familiar pattern has developed around major holidays. In the weeks following Memorial Day, across states in the South and West, cases rose and as did hospitalizations. A similar story played out in the weeks following Fourth of July and Labor Day, with travel and gatherings fueling increases broadly across the country. While Vermont was generally spared, uh, these previous holiday spikes. Recently, with colder weather moving us back inside, our state did experience a dramatic increase in cases 
in the weeks following Halloween. And that continues to impact us today. And now Thanksgiving is a mere two days away, a holiday that unfortunately brings together our two greatest concerns at the moment, travel and indoor, holiday, indoor gatherings. You can see based on mobility data from 2019 that a considerable amount of travel did occur during the Thanksgiving weekend last year, where we saw a sharp uptick in visitors over that weekend compared to the relatively quiet weeks that followed foliage season. And that travel was quite extensive. Looking at the next map, we can see that in fact, during last year's Thanksgiving weekend, Vermont received visitors from every single state in the country. Over 100,000 people are estimated to have visited Vermont during last Thanksgiving weekend, with a number just slightly smaller of Vermonters visiting other places around the region and around the country. This map shows that distribution of visits both into Vermont and out of Vermont, and you can see there's clearly a lot of visit uh, happening in the Northeast, uh, in parts that are continuing to see spikes in the Mid-Atlantic, parts of Florida, parts of Southern California. Again, you can see that the travel was broad and quite extensive. And if we have travel similar to this this year, it certainly would be quite alarming. And we can see why it's so critical that Vermonters follow the public health guidelines and the travel policy and quarantine or stay home. We looked also at a Thanksgiving analysis, trying to determine what might happen if Vermonters don't follow the public health guidelines. What might happen if Vermonters decide to continue to travel, uh, have visitors come from other parts of the country, continue to have gatherings of 10 or more people in their households? And the results are quite alarming and quite scary, actually. The, the look at this analysis, we answered three, quick, th three key questions. How many people will come to Thanksgiving with COVID-19? How many people that come to Thanksgiving would likely spread it to others who are gathering uh, with those families? And then last, how many dinners are likely to occur in Vermont in 2020? Now again, we believe Vermonters, like they always have, will respond to the public health guidelines at a rate much higher than the rest of the country. But unfortunately, national surveys indicate that 38% of individuals are still planning to have holiday gatherings with 10 or more people, including people outside of their household. If we saw numbers similar to that, 38% of Vermonters continuing to have household gatherings of 10 or more people, if we continued to see travel occurring, people not adhering to our guidelines, we would see a significant increase in cases in the weeks following Thanksgiving. In fact, we estimate from both detected and undetected cases, we would see a range of 3,200 to 3,800 new cases resulting simply from Thanksgiving gatherings. And this is on top of normal case growth that would already be occurring. Similarly, those new cases would result in somewhere between 40 and 50 hospitalizations on average. These are certainly numbers that are quite stark and quite disturbing. These numbers would also increase the concerns about community spread. It would allow cases to get into our schools to disrupt learning. It would allow cases to get into our workplaces to disrupt our paychecks. And it would allow cases to get into our long-term care facilities, putting our most vulnerable loved ones at significant risk. Now again, this is not a projection. This is not an estimate. This is really a worst case scenario. And we really need Vermonters to respond so that we don't experience anything like the numbers we just mentioned, uh, or even a small percentage of the numbers that we just mentioned, because it would have a significant impact on us during the weeks ahead. We see a case distribution on the next slide that would show what, those, what that additional case growth would look like. We would see cases spike over the next two to three weeks leading into the holiday shopping season, leading into next major religious holidays uh, in December. Uh, so again, all the more reason for us to really follow the guidance here at Thanksgiving when we have an opportunity uh, to continue uh, to keep our work, or keep following the guidance and keep our cases at a manageable level. Looking at uh, the regional update, I do want to just provide a couple of other items that are less pessimistic um, and things that I think Vermonters need to be aware of and focused on. 
you can see that the regional travel map continues to be red, and the heat map that we update every week continues to show areas of our region that have considerable growth in cases. Unfortunately, one of those areas of growth is right here in Vermont. When you look at the top 10 counties by active case counts, you'll see that Washington County is in that top 10. It's uh, higher than places in New York City metro area, higher than places in uh, outside of Boston and inside of Boston, uh, higher than uh, any county in New Hampshire or Maine. Um, so certainly, it's just something for those that live in and travel to Washington County to be uh, very mindful of just how significant the case growth is in that county uh, when compared uh, to the rest of the region. Similarly, when we look at our Vermont map, we can see that really for the first time we see sustained growth in Washington County and in Orange County. Oftentimes when we do these maps, you see cases move around the state and not necessarily in a sustained manner. But here, like the regional map indicated, there is sustained growth week over week in both Washington uh, and Orange counties. Now, there are some reasons to be optimistic about the numbers that we're seeing. Uh, for one, if we skip ahead to the regional update, you'll see that although cases did go up across the region, uh, they went up only about 12%. Last week, for example, cases went up nearly 50%. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see what the, that case increase looked like week over week over the past four or five weeks or so. The trend continued to go up in terms of the percent of cases growth, growing. And now, for the first time in weeks, we've seen that growth rate slow down. So again, some reason for optimism. When you go ahead to the next slide, you'll see again we're keeping close tabs on that 10 to 14 day period after the new mitigation measures were put into place. Now it's very early. We're just approaching that period of time where we would expect to see some results from those mitigation measures, but it is encouraging. We see case counts have stabilized, and today when we're sort of entering that first 10-day period, they're actually lower than they have been in quite some time. Similarly, looking at our Vermont forecast, you can see that even though it's trending to up still, it's not growing as quickly as it was last week. Last week, the expectation was that we would see case growth over the next four weeks of about 50 percent, now down to 41 percent. So again, certainly another positive trend. But again, with these positive trends happening right before Thanksgiving, uh, all the more important to follow the public health guidance and avoid any sort of Thanksgiving surge here in Vermont. Looking at the hospital forecasts very briefly, we talked about um, this last week. You can see the historic numbers and then the forecast numbers based on our case growth and anticipated case growth. And we've also added to this two different um, specific analyses looking at general hospital beds and then ICU beds. So the first one looks at general hospital beds. You can see even with the increase in COVID cases expected, and hopefully it's less than what's expected, we still have plenty of capacity between that green line and the rise in COVID cases. Similarly, looking at the ICU forecast, uh, even though we are expected to see ICUs increase in the next few weeks, still well below that green line threshold in terms of capacity uh, as it stands today. So again, another reason for optimism, we have sufficient hospital capacity at the moment, um, but all the more reason for us to make sure we maintain some of this, what appears to be positive momentum going into the holiday season. Just very briefly on restart, um, we've talked about a number of these items so far in the presentation, but we continue to watch our growth rate closely. We continue to watch our positivity rate closely as well, uh, waiting to see signs that both the positivity rate and the growth rates are starting to trend back down, again, during that 10 to 14 day period uh, following those intervention measures. So that's something we'll certainly be looking at this week uh, and reporting on next week. And just to go through some quick updates about K through 12, higher ed, and then long-term care facilities as well. You'll see that across the region, uh, cases in K through 12 uh, have continued to go up, although again, Vermont markedly less than the rest of Northern New England, adding 36 cases this week with a total of 110. Compare that to the 71 cases added in New Hampshire, bringing its total uh, to 574 and the 20 cases added in Maine, bringing their total to 313. 
Similarly, with higher ed, we see that uh, Vermont added 54 cases, uh, like Maine with 60 and like New Hampshire with 122. The trends in college campuses have reflected the trends in communities, not just in Vermont, but across the country. As community numbers have gone up, so too have the numbers uh, in college campuses, both here at home uh, and across the region. So again, another important reason, as many students are traveling home for Thanksgiving, for them to quarantine and follow the public health guidelines uh, so not to spread cases when they return home. And then last, this is a new update that we're providing this week, but this is an update on cases in long-term care facilities. You can see um, that there are six active outbreaks that we are reporting on, and you can see the case number there, totaling 100 cases uh, in those facilities. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. Just to begin with a few extra numbers, we reported 85 cases of COVID-19 yesterday and are reporting another 49 today. There are 22 Vermonters hospitalized, five in the ICU, and unfortunately we are now at 64 deaths. In terms of total numbers of school situations, which means cases of concern, not outbreaks, there are 43 we are currently following. Before I get into my general comments, I wanted to spend a few moments uh, about this kind of data and what's going on with hospitals. You may have noticed that while we've had an increase in hospitalizations, like the rest of the country, We've had very few in the ICU and very rare patients actually on a ventilator. I can help make some sense of this for you. Really, this is testimony to the healthcare profession's increased experience in caring for ICU patients and general patients with COVID-19, as well as advances in our medical knowledge. With one exception, this also relates to non-medication interventions. These kind of interventions include prone positioning, which helps ventilate and expand the lungs more effectively in recognition of the fact that so much of our lung capacity is actually towards our backs. In addition, the use of high-flow, humidified, pressurized oxygen through the nose or by devices like CPAP masks have been critical to success. Turns out, humidity is an enemy to the virus. And finally, the use of the steroid medication dexamethasone for patients with an oxygen saturation below 94% on room air is clearly preventing patients from requiring ventilators and probably saving lives. There are new developments around medications for patients both in the hospital and prior to possible hospitalization. The major antiviral drug that has been in use for hospitalized patients has been remdesivir. Four days ago, the World Health Organization updated its guideline, and based upon the absence of better evidence for efficacy of this medication, suggested against using it regardless of disease severity. They felt there was no indication or evidence for impact on mortality or need for mechanical ventilation or time to improvement. Practitioners in Vermont are now using this information and reevaluating their use of that drug. And the monoclonal antibody, bamlanivimab, which just received emergency use authorization from the FDA, and is being shipped to states like Vermont by the federal government, unfortunately received unfavorable reviews from both the National Institutes of Health and the Infectious Disease Society of America. The NIH felt that there was insufficient data to recommend for or against the use of this drug, which was thought indicated for preventing outpatients with mild to moderate COVID-19 from needing hospitalization and that it should only be used 
in a research trial. The Infectious Disease Society of America also suggested against routine use of this drug because of the low certainty of evidence at this time, though left as an option, use in a shared decision-making decision -making fashion, weighing the uncertain benefits and the risk for adverse events. So we've just heard from Commissioner Pichak that the surge in cases we're seeing around the country and here in Vermont is trending favorably, but it's certainly not going to end soon. But that does not mean that these rising number of cases are something that we just have to get used to. We don't throw up our hands and let the virus run rampant, overwhelming hospitals, threatening our lives uh, and those of, the, of Vermonters who are most vulnerable. We are better than that. And our track record for March until now is proof of that from a public health and a health care system standpoint and in the way we've been able to live our lives in the midst of this pandemic. But as Dr. Fauci told us, this is not the time to let our guard down and be complacent. I know that what we are telling Vermonters to do right now, to give up spending time with friends and with family members, is difficult. And I also know how done we are with this pandemic. But the fact is, Thanksgiving could make things a lot worse for us here in Vermont. The virus doesn't operate any differently just because we want to keep up traditions. As soon as we travel, get together with friends, let down our guard, we actually do risk reopening the floodgates even wider at a time when we really need to keep them closed. So if you want to keep working for your kids to stay in school, to prevent more people from potentially dying from COVID-19, Please follow the governor's orders. Don't get together with anyone outside your household and limit any travel that's not essential. And how do we know the strategy will work? Because our data tells this story well, and our prior success tells us we have the tools to suppress this virus across all communities in Vermont. And if you do gather with another household, you should quarantine. This helps prevent the spread of COVID-19 before a person knows they're sick or if they are infected with the virus and don't have any symptoms, which might happen as much as 40% of the time and leads to the insidious spread of infection, sometimes to those who can least afford to have it. Quarantine means staying home and away from other people for 14 days. Do not go to school, do not go to work, do not go out to do errands or recreation other than perhaps a walk alone in the woods. We advise you to get tested as soon as possible after the gathering and then again on day seven or later. If you continue to have no symptoms, you may end quarantine early with a negative test result. This will help give Vermonters greater confidence that they can go to work and send children to school and childcare safely. College students are also returning home to Vermont now, so I remind parents that they too need to quarantine and should also get tested. I've heard people say that Thanksgiving is canceled, but I hope Vermonters don't see it that way. Yes, admittedly, it will look different, like everything else has this year. But I believe we can be creative once again to find the joy in a smaller celebration at home within our own households. We can still make Thanksgiving special, learn to cook a new dish, or teach someone else how to do it. One of our friends has decided not to travel out of state and instead will be coaching her friends by Zoom in the art of gravy preparation and baking a pumpkin pie with her renowned crust recipe. Some may enjoy not having to cook. Think of everyone you would normally look forward to seeing and give them a call or find a way to help someone else in need. And on that note, I'd like to close this portion of my comments on the topic of gratitude. 2020 has been a challenging year for everyone, and some may feel less grateful due to job loss or food insecurity. Keep them in mind as you consider this holiday season and consider sharing with others 
such as via donations to local food shelves, which seem to be very active still during the pandemic. But for everyone, be thankful for what you can. Gratitude can help you feel more positive emotions, relish good experiences, improve your health, deal with adversity, and build strong relationships. Research shows a correlation between expressing gratitude and having a more optimistic approach. In the words of the sage philosopher Willie Nelson, who does a fantastic rendition of Moon Knight in Vermont, by the way, when I started counting my blessings, my whole life turned around. And maybe think about next Thanksgiving when we will look back on this year knowing we have done the right thing. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Well, now, open it up to questions. All right, uh, it is 1137. We have 26 in the queue. Uh, please remember to try to keep it to one or two questions. And if you do have questions about data needs, you can bring those to me separately after the press conference. We'll start in the room with Calvin. Um, thanks, Governor. So assuming the 3,800 cases, worst scenario from Thanksgiving happens, what other tools do you have in your toolbox, uh, whether it be restrictions or anything like that, to try to curb some of these cases? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful uh, that the measures we're putting into place will have a positive effect. Um, and uh, I think we're possibly seeing a little bit of that. Uh, as you might recall, it was two to three weeks ago when we had Halloween. So uh, the number of cases has dropped a little bit. Um, we'll see if this is a trend or not. Uh, so, again, I'm hopeful that we don't see that rise. Uh, but we have a lot of other tools at our disposal. Uh, we utilize them in the beginning of the pandemic and the crisis. We don't want to go there. We don't want to close down any more of the, the economy than we have. Uh, but certainly there are other approaches that we could take if necessary. But, again, we've learned a lot uh, since uh, day one. And uh, we'll do uh, whatever we can to effectively put a stop to this. But some of this, as we've seen, you know, we saw this uh, over the last uh, three to four weeks. It really is about the data and the science is showing us. It's about social gatherings. It's not about work. It's not about school. Uh, it's not about retail operations. It's about getting together uh, within your neighborhoods and with your friends at uh, recreation events and so forth. That's what's driving the uptick right now. And so if we can prevent that from happening, we won't have to take any uh, further measures. And then regarding um, students being asked when they come back from Thanksgiving if they attended a uh, gathering and also potentially employers doing the same, um, I guess how, how confident are you that, that people will tell the truth? Yeah, I, again, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm just hopeful uh, that they will uh, for the good of everyone uh, because the sooner we can put a stop to this, uh, the faster we can get out of it. And so I would ask everyone to be truthful. And, uh, and if, in anticipation of that question, uh, maybe you ought to cancel some of the plans you might have right now. I know it's difficult. You know, none of us uh, wants to go through what we're going through right now. Um, but if we, if we do, if we make these sacrifices now, um, we can get through the hump. We can get, get over the hump uh, into the next year when the, the vaccine will be there. I mean, we've seen some promising news uh, with the, uh, the vaccines. Uh, and now there's a third uh, that, uh, that is encouraging. So I believe after the first of the year, then we'll start seeing a real ramp up and uh, in really countering and going on offense. Instead of playing defense, we'll be going on offense after the first of the year. Thank you. Uh, question for Dr. Levine. The governor just brought it up, but the encouraging news about a new vaccine this week. Uh, now there are three from three of the largest drug manufacturers in the world. I'm curious uh, what your takeaways are from those initial findings and maybe which of the three vaccines you're most encouraged by and you think might be best for Vermonters? Yeah, this is very encouraging news. We have uh, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and now the AstraZeneca. Uh, several different variations on the theme of vaccine because they each have their own unique properties. Really challenging to answer your question about preferentially which one for a Vermonter versus another from the standpoint of the data, because frankly the data hasn't been released for us all to scrutinize. 
and that's important because uh, we really do want to understand their measures of efficacy and if any adverse events were more frequent in one versus another. My understanding to this point is adverse events are fairly very low percentage in them, which is very encouraging. Um, one thing that raises one above another, if they are all on equal footing, would be how many shots one has to get, because we expect, due to human nature, some people will forget the second shot, or for some reason won't want to do that, so a vaccine that had only one would be nice. The other thing is the storage temperature. And as we know, the first one, the Pfizer, uh, requires the ultra-cold, uh, very specialized freezers, whereas the last one, the uh, AstraZeneca, does not. So um, th those could be considerations, but we're kind of ready for both because we already have the freezer capacity. And as Commissioner Sherling said a couple of uh, press conferences ago, we received even more. Uh, to make sure that that won't be an issue. So I'm encouraged. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're going to move to the phone, starting with Ethan from the Burlington Free Press. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Rick. Go ahead. Uh, so there was a recent New York Times article, uh, I believe it came out uh, yesterday, um, that seems to be calling into question state orders around limiting small gathers. It cited some national epidemiologists who were claiming that there was uh, little evidence to substantiate that prior social gatherings are the primary stores for the types of outbreaks versus. Um, but I know we just got to see today's modeling, so I was curious if uh, yourself, Governor Scott, or Dr. Levine, or Commissioner Pichek, I have mean, anything to say about the article if you've got a chance to read it. What were, what were your responses? Yeah, um, again, I, I will refer to Dr. Levine, um, but from my perspective, I did read the article. Uh, I think uh, in some respects uh, it was unfair um, because they really weren't on the ground here in Vermont. Uh, what works in New York City or what works in California uh, doesn't necessarily work here and vice versa. We relied heavily on the data. I, I can tell you from the contact tracing, we did. It all points to social gathering. Every single, almost every single one of those cases uh, was derived from a social gathering. Uh, the outbreaks we're seeing in Washington County in particular will point to that. So uh, in some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the analogies they were using, uh, I remember one in particular, uh, they said uh, that it was counterintuitive uh, that you could have nine friends and go to a restaurant for, for dinner uh, or lunch, uh, but you couldn't have them over to your house. Well, that's not the case here in Vermont. Uh, we only allow you to go to a restaurant that, first of all, uh, we are at 50% capacity in our restaurants. Secondly, uh, you can only gather, uh, you can only uh, uh, go to a restaurant within your immediate household. Uh, you can't have nine of your friends and go to a, a restaurant. So I thought it was a bit unfair in many respects and didn't really dig into what we do here in Vermont. And, and I just want to go back uh, to what we've done thus far, everything that we've done. We haven't done everything right, uh, but for the most part, we've done better than most other states, uh, and we've been highlighted uh, because of that. And I would say what we're doing today, I believe, uh, will be beneficial for us, especially over the next uh, a couple of months. And um, again, we, we rely on the, the data and the science and, and get together as a group with all the experts and make decisions based on what we're seeing on the ground. And uh, I don't think the uh, the reporter really got in on the, on the ground here in Vermont uh, to see what we're going through and why we're doing what we're doing, because I, I think it was based uh, specifically on uh, on the science and the data. Dr. Levine. Well, I could only echo what the governor said. Uh, there may be states where actually the data does not support uh, mass gatherings being a prime culprit in their surge in cases. Uh, but you only have to look to events like the motorcycle rally at Sturgis to know that a really large gathering can cause a lot of trouble. And then you go to Maine and look at a church gathering um, and uh, in an unmasked state and know that that can cause a lot of trouble. Our Vermont data clearly points us 
to the strategic priorities and moves that we've made. Uh, specifically, looking at travel and looking at not mass gatherings, but even small gatherings. Um, and as the governor said, the Washington County data supports that the most. The other part of the article, unfortunately, was it didn't actually acknowledge the uh, good work Vermonters have done and uh, the vast experience we've had since March uh, to account for, the, for our successes and kind of picked on the issue of uh, taking a walk with a friend, which as you heard at the last press conference is certainly acceptable in Vermont at this point in time, but we don't want to have people gathering together, not socially distanced, not wearing masks, and feeling that the comfort of the outdoors makes that all possible in getting together in a large group from multiple households for uh, physical activity outside in that way. Uh, so I can accept the fact they couldn't nuance everything in the article um, when they're trying to cover numerous states. But I, I think we've uh, answered your concerns satisfactorly. Great, thank you. Uh, my last question is geared towards uh, Secretary French. I was curious, uh, is the if the event concerns that families might hide information about their family gathering to avoid having to remote learn, um, based off of just what uh, Governor Scott said about the state allowing schools to rash families if they gather with other households? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a concern. I mean, we issued some guidance late yesterday to help with that and give schools some more specificity on how to address those kinds of issues. Certainly, we're hoping um, you know, everyone will be forthcoming with their plans. You know, our common goal here is to contain the virus. So we're hopeful our new guidance will be uh, assisting districts in uh, navigating those issues. Thank you. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, uh, some people have said they were sort of flabbergasted to hear uh, Governor Cuomo was being awarded an Emmy apparently for his response to COVID-19 uh, in New York. And this day, I was going to ask you your reaction to that award, but instead, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, it may be time to publicly offer a thanks for your personal leadership in Vermont during COVID-19. Um, yes, some of your state orders may have been unpopular, and you also understand that reporters serve as watchdogs, not lapdogs. But yet you stood here for about, I think, 90 press conferences answering any and all questions. That's probably about 180 hours. As journalists, we talk, and this is really unprecedented transparency and really appreciated. Many of the questions come from readers and listeners across the state with concerns, but you answer them all. And we want the state of the state do in part to you. So I'm going to pass some questions today. Instead, my wife and I wish you and your family a wonderful, peaceful Thanksgiving. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Mike. And uh, likewise, we wish you and all the media and all Vermonters a uh, very safe and peaceful uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And remember what's really important uh, to each and every one of us. Uh, but I will we'll go back, and it's, it's not me. It's us. Uh, it's us as a, as a state, as a, as a team, um, as Vermonters. Uh, we've we've done a lot of things right, uh, and uh, adhere to the guidance, used our common sense, our ingenuity, and so forth uh, to get us through this. We're going to need to dig deep and get a little bit more of that, uh, and use a little bit more of that uh, over the next few months. Uh, but I'm confident, confident we'll get through this. And I, I'm so blessed myself. Uh, to be surrounded by such a competent um, team, uh, such a talented team um, across the board throughout state government and is so impressed. And, and the sacrifices they've made and, and the sacrifices many are going to make on Thanksgiving Day uh, because, you know, this is, Dr. Levine has said, uh, the virus doesn't know that we're having a holiday. Um, so uh, there are going to be numerous people in the health department, the EPI team, uh, and testers, National Guard, uh, public safety, and many, many others who are going to be working on that day, just like a normal day. So uh, think about them and the sacrifice you might have to make, but think about the sacrifices that they're making for us. So again, thank you very much, Mike, for the accolades, but uh, it really is a, a, a team, uh, team thanks to Team Vermont. 
Okay, we'll move to Andrew at the Caledonian Record. Yes, good morning, thank you. Uh, I presume this is for Dr. Levine. Um, uh, eight cases in Essex County is very notable, especially given the decreasing numbers across the rest of the state in today's report. Anything going on with that? Yes, thanks for that question. That, the facts around those eight cases will all be being determined today. So I can't give you the results of that yet because you know, those test results come in overnight and then we uh, connect with them all. So I, can't, I can tell you that a lot of the increased activity in uh, Essex County um, is along the border. Um, and there are schools, there are employers that uh, people from New Hampshire come over to Vermont and vice versa. Um, we do know that there's a very uh, high concentration of COVID um, in that part of New Hampshire as well. So um, I can only make some speculation that it's all related to the same process, but I don't have any new, new information on the eight cases you mentioned. We continue though to watch both Orleans and Essex County as places that we didn't traditionally see in our uh, reporting and we're seeing them with more frequency now. So uh, that's just my uh, caution to people to realize that you can be very, very, very rural and it has no protection against the virus. And that's not just the Ver Vermont phenomenon, that's a nationwide phenomenon. Um, you, uh, you've been warning about the possibility of with Northern New Hampshire especially, uh, cases and uh, the virus um, infiltrating uh, through um, uh, cross-border travel. Do, are your contact tracers finding examples of people that are um, ignoring the uh, ignoring the cross-border travel ban, or are, are these doubling up as a result of essential travel that's just a natural course of events in that, um, in that corner of the state? Yeah, I think, I think uh, almost all of those initial cases were related to essential travel, if you will. But again, uh, um, you know, it's a little hard to know if it was essential travel and still advise uh, use, use of the guidance with regard to masking and with regard to physical distancing because it really is, you know, a package. Everybody has to abide by all of those pieces of guidance. Uh, to protect themselves and others. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and then one other quick question. Any initial takeaways uh, from the school surveillance testing that was conducted last week? Are, are all the results back at this point? And, and do, you, uh, do you or um, AUE, I guess, have a, have a total number of positives that, uh, that were a result of this test? Yeah, so I assume by now all the results are back by today. They weren't actually by yesterday. Um, so we were tallying them up. I, I was on um, the air yesterday and mentioned that we thought that the positivity rate would be well below 0.5%, possibly in the 0.25% range. So we're talking, you know, less than a couple dozen cases out of nine plus thousand people but I don't have the precise number of cases and the precise number of uh, tests yet, so I can't give you uh, those numbers with certainty at this point. But there's going to be a very small number, which is uh, reassuring and gratifying, and I think speaks, if nothing else, to the dedication of school staff and teachers who want to keep their schools open and want to keep their kids in as much in-person education as possible. Okay, thank you for your time. Greg, the County Courier. Good morning, Governor. Uh, I shared my sentiment, but I'm gonna pick up this works here and uh, hopefully ask a couple targeting questions for you. Um, I, I'd like to start by trying to get a, an answer that couldn't really be answered much on Friday. Uh, what does the state really have for enforcement if somebody refuses to quarantine and is tested positive? Uh, that question was uh, emailed to your staff, forwarded to the health department, still not returned. 
Uh, and, and Governor Nunn, that you plan the weekend to, to mull that over. Will you be adding that to your uh, your executive order? Yeah, you know, the executive order uh, gives a, a broad reach of powers uh, in some respect, uh, Greg. So there's a lot of tools in the toolbox that I could use. Uh, I've chosen, I think I've said this a, new, a number of times, I've chosen not to use those tools uh, except in egregious cases. I mean, take, for example, uh, the situation in Rutland with the gym. Um, we ended up, the Attorney General uh, was involved. Uh, they ended up going to court. Uh, they ended up being resolved in, in some uh, capacity, but but that was uh, the, the step we decided to take because um, someone uh, decided to to, um, to ignore uh, the executive order. Uh, but so the powers are immense, uh, but again, I've chosen to use this wisely uh, and not to impose fines, not to impose any other sanctions, uh, so to speak, at this point in time. Uh, because I think what we're doing is working. I think people are adhering. The vast majority of Vermonters are doing the right thing. And uh, so we don't want to use a, a broad brush. Uh, we don't want to use uh, our limited resources uh, and uh, public safety uh, to go after people who aren't doing the right thing because I'm not sure that it's going to gain us all that much. So again, I just uh, just understand uh, that these uh, powers are, are broad uh, and this is a, like a law in some respects when you impose uh, something like this an emergency executive order. But, um, but, but again, we, we think what we're doing is working. So am I misunderstanding uh, your statement from Friday that I was under the understanding that the executive order does not have any enforcement power for those who have tested positive and, and refused to quarantine. No, was I, no, I was think I misunderstanding you when you said that. No, I, yeah, I th we we could impose many many sanctions against those uh, folks that don't choose to follow the executive order uh, because the, the again the powers are immense, uh, but we've chosen not to go that route. But we could. Okay. And and I'll leave you with one more question here. Uh, I noticed on uh, Interstate 89 there are new metal signs uh, at incremental exits advising of the travel ban, uh, you must quarantine, et cetera. Um, knowing that these are fairly permanent metal signs, not electronic signs, um, what what do you know as far as time frame that, that hasn't been shared with the general public because yeah, don't, your, your uh, executive order right. goes month to month so yeah don't don't take don't take the metal signs as, as some as some sort of a sign uh, so to speak uh, for the future um, it's just a, from a practical standpoint the electronic uh, signs are uh, are solar powered uh, during the winter uh, the the extent of the uh, the, the power. Uh, is uh, not as, as broad as in the summer. I don't get as much sunlight. Uh, and again, uh, the cold weather um, cuts down on the amount of uh, power that's necessary to, to light up the signs. So we just thought it was uh, much more practical uh, to, uh, to make up these signs so we could do it quickly and uh, put, it, put them up. Just, so we, we got them up and running within a week or two period. Um, so we could very easily uh, take them down in a week or two uh, period. Uh, so this is just, it was just a practical, uh, you know, much more uh, efficient and cost effective uh, than the, uh, the, the movable solar operated uh, um, um, electronic signs. All right, we're gonna move to Wilson. Thank you, Governor, happy holiday. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Wilson of the Associated Press. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, another question about the uh, uh, the school. I'm not coming up with the uh, right words to describe it, but while I certainly understand that the goal of what you're trying to accomplish with that, doesn't that put the state and the schools, I suppose, in the position of getting kids to tattle on their parents? Um, and that seems to have some, to me anyway, some pretty negative uh, connotations that go with that. And I was wondering if that's something you thought through uh, it, when you came up with this idea. Yeah, again, I'm going to refer to Secretary French, but uh, from my standpoint, uh, this is, again, uh, you know, fair warning uh, to those of you 
who are planning to have uh, gatherings where you're having from other outside your household at your homes for Thanksgiving. Um, and if, if you don't want uh, your, your kids uh, to have to transition to remote learning uh, for a, and quarantine for a seven day period, uh, maybe you ought to make other plans. Uh, and, and that's the message right now. In terms of, uh, we're, we're asking people to tell the truth uh, to protect others. Uh, I don't think it's tattling on anyone, and, and I'm not sure that it's all about uh, the kids. Uh, the, the parents uh, play a role in this as well. So, Secretary French, uh, can you add to this? Uh, yes, Governor. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it is challenging for school districts. We, uh, what we did with our guidance is we situated the issue inside the daily health check, uh, which is generally something that parents complete. Uh, so parents will uh, basically be attesting uh, to this along with their travel and symptoms of their students and so forth. But I think that's a good place to put it. And I know, um, you know, Dr. Levine and I were on Vermont Vision uh, the other day and uh, listening to Superintendent Bonefield from Montpelier. Uh, she, you know, she used a strategy, I think, which is indicative of what a lot of leaders are doing now. She had surveyed her families well in advance, uh, trying to get them to be forthcoming. So I think she remarked it's all about trust and, um, you know, schools operate on trust with their parents and their students and uh, we're hopeful this uh, guidance will give them some additional tools to uh, help everyone do the right thing and keep the school safe. Um, okay, great. Thank you very much. Sean, the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Uh, two very quick questions. Uh, is there an update on rolling out the 14 expanded hours testing sites that were announced last week? And second, when the administration was putting together the hazard pay grant program, was any thought given to volunteers, like ambulance rescue, fire workers who risk COVID exposure but don't qualify as employees? Um, well, yes, the first one. Um, with maybe Secretary Smith, are you on the line? Can you give a, an update? on the testing? I, I sure can, Governor. They, as you know, we rolled out five sites uh, last week. We're rolling out additional sites this week. I'll get an update to the Chester newspaper on where those sites are. I don't have them sitting in front of me. Uh, and then we're on track to roll out the, the total 14 sites by the end of the month. Uh, so we are uh, on track to do that right now. Um, in answer to your second question, I think I, I know the answer, but I'm going to ask Commissioner Pichek uh, to answer that to, to make sure he was the one that uh, his uh, agency headed that up. So, Commissioner Pichek. Thank you, Governor, and I hope we give the same answer. Uh, but the uh, answer to your question, Sean, is that, you know, the, the program was designed um, you know, primarily uh, by the legislature. Um, we administered the program, uh, but we didn't have, um, you know, we didn't work on it in the legislature. Um, it was something we volunteered to do, and we were happy to do it, and it was pro provided to us. Um, my own mother volunteers uh, at a soup kitchen. I know she was quite disappointed that she didn't get any of the hazard pay as well. So I think it was just one of these scenarios where um, not every scenario could be contemplated, and uh, it had to be focused on those that uh, were actually employees earning, earning pay. Um, but again, we didn't have a hand in that. Okay, thank you very much. Tom, B.T. Digger. Thank you. I, uh, I've been thinking about uh, this Thanksgiving period. I've been thinking about this Thanksgiving period, and uh, we know from the uh, ice rink outbreak and from Halloween parties that that uh, those were caused really by people who did not follow the guidelines. Um, I was also thinking about uh, President Reagan who once said trust but verify. Uh, and uh, you know, the holiday travel period, uh, is there some movement, some, some possibility in between when you're asking people to do the right thing and then when you find that a case has developed because they didn't, is there something in the middle that the state could do to encourage more strongly uh, the, the, the people to do the right thing rather than, you know, <laughs> Governor, I, 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 I appreciate you appealing to people's higher angels, but, uh, uh, you know, it's not, there are issues with that. 
Uh, yeah, t Tom, um, I'm not naive. Um, I understand that there, and I said that in my remarks, that I understand that people are, some people are not going to do the right thing uh, and are going to continue to gather. And uh, we gave all kinds of warning and guidance uh, before Halloween. And then we saw that there were a number of Halloween parties. Um, but we need to, you know, I don't want to get caught up in trying to look back, uh, only to learn from what we experienced and to try and guide in the future. Um, so uh, the same will be here because it'll be uh, obviously, uh, even if we continue to trend downwards, which I'm hopeful that we're doing uh, because Halloween was uh, three weeks uh, uh, in the past, um, hopefully we'll be trending downward. It will be um, a week to, to 10 days or two weeks uh, before we are able to see whether we were um, everyone complied or the most people complied uh, with our request not to gather. Uh, so we'll see the spike if there is one about uh, you know, a week, 10 days, two weeks from now. Um, so again, I'm not sure what we do uh, to go backwards uh, to, to try and uh, right the wrong that already happened. Uh, we can only look forward and do the best we can and, and really reach out and, and I'm you know, I'm counting on the media to send this message. I'm hopeful uh, that people who are listening to this uh, today will send the message. I hope that uh, those uh, that heard the message about schools and the questions that are going to be asked uh, of you uh, that may want to keep their kids in school for their own benefit um, will uh, will change plans. So uh, that's our that's our message for today. Uh, really think about you know, is it worth it uh, to have a big household gathering uh, when you may have to keep your kids home for the next week or two, or you yourself uh, might stay home, or the risk associated with that. Uh, again, I, I think it's uh, somewhere in, in between 25 and 50 percent uh, could be in some areas of Vermont. If you had, if you had a, a household gathering in Washington County today or on Thursday, um, the risk of you uh, becoming positive are somewhere between 25 and 50 percent, I believe. And that should be enough of a deterrent, I would think. Okay. I guess we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. John, BPR. Thank you. Um, this is sort of a, a, a question about policing <clears throat> personal behavior. Um, I've been hearing some pushback from local law enforcement about what they're being asked to do, uh, especially in, with regard to checking on businesses for these health and safety assessments. And then secondly, they get fed these um, point in time complaints. Uh, local agencies are, are, are funneled these uh, through the state portal. And often they're you know, uh, about three or four people getting together or Joe's not wearing a mask. And this is coming at a time uh, when local agencies are, in fact, you know, trying to restrict their interactions with the public due to the pandemic. So I'm hoping um, maybe Commissioner Sherling could clarify what exactly is being asked of local law enforcement to do in terms of enforcing the governor's executive order and these COVID restrictions. Commissioner Sherling, would you like to try and answer that? Uh, certainly. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so uh, two paths here. Uh, one is uh, relative to the health and safety assessments. Um, those are those have been put out to local agencies as options. Um, if they want to participate, uh, they're willing to do so. If not, uh, state assets are, are working on that. We've done uh, just about a thousand of those so far, and the numbers of uh, notable non-compliance still haven't risen above 11 total. So uh, again, large scale uh, compliance. And we have a number of local agencies that aren't participating. Relative to uh, what's coming through the portal and going out to law enforcement agencies, those are not a point in time uh, instance. Those may be passed along for informational purposes. Uh, but the only things that are going out for uh, potential, again, health and safety assessments uh, and educational outreach are the ones that uh, uh, are not those 
meeting moments. Uh, they're really more business compliance kinds of things. And again, not large numbers, but uh, but a few things here and there that are worthy of educational follow-up. And it, have there been, you know, enforcement actions, prosecutions, fines, citations uh, as a result of these? No, again, as the governor expressed earlier, the, the, the primary mechanism at this point remains education, and that has worked incredibly well now for uh, for nine months. There are a few um, there are a few folks that are a little more emboldened on, uh, on non-compliance, uh, but again, that number is a tiny handful compared to the thousands uh, of businesses and individuals who are doing their best to ensure that they're. Uh, keeping themselves, their friends and family, and their customers safe. Great, thank you. Pat, WCAS. Hi, this question is for Dr. Levine. I had a viewer ask a question that I couldn't really find a good answer for, so I'll throw it to you. As we prepare for the first vaccine to be available, any sense of how long it takes between the time the person gets the COVID-19 vaccine and the time that their body develops the immunity to the virus? Is this a matter of like hours, days, or weeks? Yeah, thanks, Kat. It's a matter of weeks, so it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I think the information we get from the trials themselves, where they're obviously these are participants in research, so they're probably having uh, assessment of their antibody status done over periods of time. Uh, that would give us a much better picture. I think in the phase one or two trials, before these phase three trials, some of that information was available. I'm just not aware of it being any faster than a few weeks. Um, but to qualify to get to the phase three trials, they did have to actually look at antibodies being formed in the uh, subjects who got the vaccine. And so then for the two dose shots, based on what we know right now about the vaccine, if someone only got one of the two, as you indicated earlier, might happen despite best efforts to encourage them to get both, would they be partially protected with just one of the shots or not protected at all? They would probably be partially protected. We see that with some of the uh, vaccine experience we've had over, you know, now decades and decades. Um, not optimal to only get one shot not uh, a guarantee you'll have any kind of protection that's meaningful, but possibly partial. Uh, but it's, it's really um, the, the, the ones that are being tested now that require two shots, it's because the earlier trials, I think, demonstrated that that's what's necessary to get a sustained antibody response. Great, thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Hi. Go ahead, Erin. I was wondering if there has been hi, uh, hi. Uh, I was wondering if there have been any updates on state meetings with towns and local oh. officials uh, in terms of like what you've heard that local towns need uh, from the state and what the, if the state is planning any kind of. Um, Programs or additional support for places that are experiencing outbreaks right now? Um, we did have some, some meetings with some local communities in Washington County. I know uh, Secretary Smith, I, maybe Commissioner Sherling was involved in that. I might ask them if there's anything more to offer um, in terms of the question. Yes, Governor, we met with uh, local officials both in Washington County and Orange County and talked about how we can communicate a message to both of those counties through local trusted uh, local officials. So we really uh, spent some time talking with them, asking them what they needed, provided them with information so that they could get it out to their communities, listen to them on some of the steps that they were taking, like closing uh, some of their town halls are going remote with some of their town halls and others. As you know, we had, Washington County, as uh, Commissioner Pichek has talked about, is one of the most intense and hardest hit areas here in Vermont. So we spent a lot of time with them uh, because of, of the situation in Washington County. 
we certainly would be um, amenable to to uh, meeting with other uh, local officials if if they ask. Uh, you know, we have regular meetings with the city of Burlington, for example. We have regular meetings with various. Uh, entities on a regular basis, whether it's colleges, whether it's healthcare organizations, and as I said, with local officials in Washington and Orange County. So um, we we would be amenable to having uh, those same discussions in any county that felt that they needed uh, some sort of assistance in what is going on in the transmittal of information to their citizens. Aaron, we also. Uh, I just, uh, oh, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry about that, Governor. Uh, I would just add uh, there is a weekly call held by the Emergency Operations Center with municipal officials to uh, share information and uh, take in requests for uh, any kind of assistance that they may need or information that needs to flow. And I was going to add as well uh, we have uh, the League of Cities and Towns uh, who have an open line of communication with us. Uh, as well as the mayor's coalition, as well as the 180 legislators uh, that uh, that aren't shy about uh, reaching out to us if there's a problem in their community. So we have all kinds of uh, approaches that were taken, uh, as well as uh, this forum today. So uh, we hope we're staying in touch with uh, communities across Vermont. But if anyone has a question, uh, please let us know. I mean, if there's anything we can do, we want to help in any way we can. Uh, we can't solve all the problems, but, um, but again, we'll give it a try. Governor, I also, oh, oh. I also uh, okay. would shout out to the, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. They were very instrumental in helping uh, both Commissioner Levine and myself meet with local officials and convey information to local officials in Orange and Washington County. Okay, thank you. I uh, also wanted to uh, just say that I appreciate the new uh, nursing home data that I asked for last week appearing in the um, following report. So okay. thanks to the person who pulled that together. Thank you, Erin. That's all. Stewart, NBC5. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, a, a brand new U.S. Canada task force has just started work on recommendations for how the northern border will eventually reopen. Uh, there are a couple of former governors, two former premiers or Canadian ministers on it. Uh, the key question seems to be how to make sure that there's public confidence and whether health screening should be incorporated into the usual you know, inspection process at the border. What would your team like to see um, and have you had any communication with Quebec? Um, we are always uh, speaking with Quebec. We try and keep an open line of communication with them, obviously being very important to us, sharing a border, a largest trading partner. Look forward uh, to them coming back into Vermont and us going back into, uh, into Quebec and Canada. Um, but, uh, but at this point in time, uh, from my perspective, what we've been planning, you know, we, we use the travel map and the modeling over the last uh, number of months, and I think that that's been beneficial for us here as a region uh, within the states. Uh, so um, I would like for us to look outward, and we've started to do that, uh, to keep track of their ridings and so forth uh, in uh, communities uh, throughout Quebec to be sure that we're using that same approach because it works uh, here in the states as a region, and I believe that it would work for us uh, in uh, in Canada as well. So. Um, just, you know, I think, I think they have an interest, obviously, in uh, keeping their uh, their uh, province uh, um, uh, protected, uh, and we have a, an interest in keeping our state protected uh, as well. So, uh, I think that is a common interest uh, with both of us. So, I think we'll arrive at something, but I haven't been part of, uh, nor do I know the composition of the, the group you're you're uh, speaking to. Okay, speaking of uh, communication, have you had any regarding a potential Sanders cabinet appointment? No. Thank you. All right, Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Oh, good 
morning. Um, I think this is for Dr. Levine. Um, given the fact that um, UVM is taking part in the phase three trials for the AstraZeneca vaccine, would that eventually be approved? Does that mean that you and the Department of Health working with the university would have more insight into the qualities of the vaccine and how it might uh, be used in the state than you would say, for other vaccines? That's a, a really good question, Joe. Thank you for that. I think the way these vaccine trials work, <clears throat> these are tens of thousands of uh, participants who are enrolled into the studies, and the UVM component will be but a small part of that. The good news is the UVM component is going to probably reflect the Vermont demographic a little better, and that will mean it contributes more people at a higher age than some of the other sites might be contributing to the study, which will give us a little bit of insight. But from a statistical standpoint, the numbers of patients, uh, participants in the study here uh, may not give us as much insight as you'd want because um, it just won't be a robust enough number. It, it'll be a significant number contributed to the study, just not a robust enough number to do a lot of independent statistical analysis on. It also probably won't mean we have any uh, greater ability to access that vaccine just because we were a site, because this is, as you know, all being done on a federal basis, um, and uh, we, won't, we won't have any advantage in that. Thank you. Um, one other question, uh, this I think for Commissioner Harrington. Um, looking at the state unemployment figures, it appears to me at least as if as many as nearly 10,000 people could drop off the unemployment rolls due to the, um, the ending of the uh, CARES Act extensions of unemployment. Um, that's about half the people who are currently receiving benefits. Is there any um, plan at all uh, to provide additional assistance using state money? Yeah, um, I'll answer part of that, and maybe uh, Commissioner Harrington can add to it. Um, but, uh, but we've been, as we've spoken about in previous press conferences, I'm very concerned uh, about this. And uh, we've reached out uh, to the Secretary of Labor, uh, as well as our congressional delegation. We're still continuing uh, to do that outreach because, uh, as you stated, uh, this would have a detrimental effect on many uh, who still need uh, unemployment assistance. Um, so uh, to answer the second part of the, the question, we don't have the resources. Um, we're talking, you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, every single week uh, that we don't have. Uh, we can't dip into the, to the trust fund, um, the uh, unemployment trust fund, to, to use what we have for this purpose, and we don't have the resources to do this either. So at this point in time, we're hoping uh, that the uh, – uh, the Secretary of Labor or Congress. There are many other states who fall in the same situation. They're, they're facing the same dilemma that we are. So uh, we are uh, working with the uh, other governors uh, as well as uh, our congressional de delegation and others in the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Congress uh, to do something about this um, because, again, this will have a de detrimental effect on individuals. Uh, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, Governor, I think you hit on all the major points. I would simply add um, that, you know, unfortunately, uh, I think our biggest concern is that number is probably going to be a lot higher. Uh, it should um, all the programs that are um, expected to end in the coming weeks actually do, and that could also include a, a triggering off or an ending of our extended benefits program. Uh, as well as the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program, which is the CARES Act program, as well as the other CARES Act program known as PUA or Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. So when you add all those factors up and recognize that as people are moving through the traditional UI system, they're eventually coming uh, up on those programs, should those programs end, 
um, you know, it will have a, a much larger impact on this filing population as well as any new filers that come in the door. Um, so as the governor said, we are, are actively monitoring this situation. You know, to give some context, if we took the average weekly benefit amount and the number of people who are filing right now, uh, we are looking at about $10 million each week in benefits that are being paid out. And if you were to um, subsidize, you know, a state-funded extended benefits program, you're probably looking at anywhere from 150 to $200 million um, for a 13-week program. Uh, so again, you know, certainly without um, outside of our reach as a as a state, um, and that's why it's so important that um, you know uh, members of the federal level uh, act as quickly as possible. Yeah, and Joe and Joe, it's really important uh, for Congress after they get back from their holiday break to take action, make the best deal they can, come together, and do what's right for the for the people. And, uh, and, and it may not be everything they want, uh, but just as a stopgap measure, there are a number of initiatives they should be working on right now uh, to help us, the states, and the people, and our constituents, the people, the citizens of our states, uh, help them out. Uh, that's what they're there for. So I'm pleading with them uh, to get back to work. Governor, I would just add to uh, this may be the right opportunity to say that um, you know, well, well, we haven't formally uh, turned back on the work search requirement. Um, that shouldn't dissuade anybody from actively uh, looking for reemployment opportunities. Um, you know, UI has always been uh, a finite amount of weeks. Uh, it's just a question of how many weeks, and, and really is meant as a bridge or a stopgap between uh, employment opportunities. And so, people who are on unemployment right now, if they are are physically able to be looking for work and accepting work, they should be doing so. And we can be a research for that, or a resource for that. Uh, we're the labor department, not the unemployment uh, department. So we can help with that. So if anyone out there uh, wants to work, can work, um, please uh, reach out to us to, to go to our job link page and see what's, what's there and what's available. Hello, we've got some questions from local innkeepers about the new guidelines. Under the new no gathering or mixing of household guidelines, are innkeepers considered a household and thereby prevented from hosting any guests? And then secondarily, if they are allowed to accept guests, can they accept multiple individual reservations and still meet the no gathering of household guidance, since each individual reservation could represent a separate household in a separate room? Uh, yeah, Secretary Curley. Hi there, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so innkeepers are, are not considered, uh, uh, we don't have to worry about them being separate households. This is what they do, this is this is what they offer as their employment. Um, people that come and stay in their inns, if they have their, their own room and their own bathroom, um, they can rent rooms to different households in those scenarios. Again, they shouldn't be pulling them together to do um, dining clothes together, but set up just like a restaurant would, where separate households are seated at different tables, properly spaced according to our um, restaurant guidelines. Um, I think I might have missed the third question in there. Oh, there was another. Was, um, oh, the, sorry. Each, each individual record, reservation represents a separate household, and I think you answered yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question for, thank you very much, Secretary Curley. A uh, quick question for Secretary Smith. Will there be increased testing available the week after Thanksgiving for returning college students? The reader notes that there's very little available on the Department of Health website for November 30th and afterwards. Yeah, you'll see, thank you for the question. You'll see a fairly significant increase in the testing capabilities. I just want to make sure that people understand what we're talking about with testing. We have the new testing that's coming up online, and that is these on-demand testing, seven days a week with multiple hours, including evening hours. Plus, we still have the pop-up testing that's going on when we see hotspots around the state that everybody's used to 
the pop-up. Uh, registration will be coming online for uh, those new testing. And I want to talk about that a little bit because I had an earlier question and it was a great question. Last week we opened up these new, what we call on-demand testing for Vermonters to come on, on-demand, seven days a week in Middlebury, Waterbury, Rutland, Brattleboro, and Burlington. This week we've opened up additional sites in Berlin, Northfield, Stratton, Newport, St. Johnsbury, Fairley, and Bennington. And then next week we'll be opening up sites in Springfield, Morrisville, White River Junction, and Franklin County, and we're finalizing the site in Franklin County. So there will be, uh, there should be sufficient uh, uh, testing, as, as Dr. Levine talked about, and as Mike Pichak talked about. I mean, we, we tested over 41,000 uh, people last, uh, last seven days uh, with a rolling average above 6,000. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of testing going on above and beyond what is the normal college testing that will cut away and then we'll uh, we'll have all these additional testing sites up and running thank you very much and lisa you were referring to uh, just to make sure everyone's clear referring to college students vermont kids returning back home after uh, for their for their break correct yes okay yes. all right thanks all right guy page Uh, Governor Scott or Commissioner Pichek, last year over Thanksgiving, the World Cup in Killington alone to 36,500 attendees, many from out of state. That won't be happening this year. So is it really accurate to use 2019 Thanksgiving visitation numbers to project and spike in 2020 new cases, hospitalizations, deaths? Yeah, thanks for the question, guys. So the mobility data about 2019 was simply for illustrative purposes to look at the type, the amount of travel that occurred um, during the Thanksgiving weekend. We said it was over 100,000 people. We think maybe it was more like 125,000 people. So certainly that event could have uh, contributed to a lot, um, but still quite a significant number separate from that. For the Thanksgiving analysis, we simply looked at uh, recent national surveys about people's um, interest in continuing to have uh, a holiday um, a dinner uh, with guests of 10 or more, um, and then made some reasonable estimates about uh, the percent of those visitors that would be out of state. So there are two different analyses, so uh, the uh, 2019 was not the basis for that Thanksgiving analysis. Okay, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, I noticed that uh, several restaurants, including houses in Burlington, have decided to suspend operations definitely. Is the seventy-five million just not the new seventy-five million just not enough? And what do you what do you say to these small uh, businesses, especially in the hospitality industry, that even with this extra money that you're providing, it's just not going to be enough? Yeah, it, it definitely is not enough, uh, and I think we've, we've talked about that over the last uh, month or so, um, but it is a stopgap measure, uh, and it's a reality. That's, that's what we had available uh, to, to inject and to help uh, some of these businesses survive, and I think that that's what we're seeing. Uh, some are making the decision that it's just not worth staying open at this point in time. Um, I'm, uh, I'm taking uh, from, uh, from some of their uh, Comments uh, that uh, that this is just a pause that they're they are coming they're they're going to be reopening at some point in time, uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that we'll see some action uh, from Congress to provide more stimulus money so that we can put it in the uh, in the pockets of uh, of those who are in desperate need, um, and we're going to see this uh, you know a bit of an uptick I believe over the next uh, couple of months as we get over the hump, and so. Uh, the hospitality sector in alo alone uh, has a need of five or six hundred million dollars, and uh, and we just don't have the resources to provide them with that assistance at this point in time. 
but again, I'm hopeful um, that uh, that Congress will take action. I believe they will, um, but we'll see what the program looks like uh, once they get back into uh, into session. And it sounded like there's a little bit of a complaint uh, because of the what Lisa was mentioning about the end about uh, the single household going to restaurants if that wasn't working for them. Any, any comment on that part of it? Uh, we're just going back uh, to, again, the data and the science, and we know what's driving uh, the number of cases uh, uh, increasing, and it's being different households gathering together. So uh, we wanted to be sure uh, that we're doing all we can and providing, again, for some to utilize the restaurants within their household, within their family, and going to a restaurant. Uh, we're not seeing that there's a... Uh, uh, there's the amount of uh, spread of the virus in those situations. So we just think it's, uh, it's, it's the best policy uh, that we could put forward uh, to get us through this. It's not ideal, obviously. All right, great, thanks. Lisa, the Waterbury Roundabout. Good afternoon. Um, I think my first question is for uh, Secretary French. Go ahead. It's about the um, the guidance that you've given to schools about the questionnaire that the students will be asked when they return after Thanksgiving. I was looking on the website. I don't see it posted yet. I'm wondering if that will be posted on the AOE site. Um, and I'm wondering if you've asked school districts to communicate that to families before Thanksgiving break. I mean, that's most Today's the last day that school is in session before Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and as a parent of a middle schooler, I don't participate at all in the, uh, the survey that she, my daughter receives every day when she goes to school. The middle school kids um, answer those questions independently um, after they've been dropped off, etc. Um, I'm just wondering like, if how parents will get the heads up that this is going to be part of the screening when they, their kids return to school next week. Yes, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yes, the guidance should be up. Uh, if not, we can send a copy out to you. Uh, it did go out late yesterday afternoon, and I know to your question, uh, districts are in the process of communicating that to the families right now. Um, and you're correct, in some districts, uh, typically with older students, we see the students themselves completing the health check, uh, but it's more common that parents do that, particularly with the younger students. But it is, um, I think, you know, fair question about the urgency uh, relative to the executive order, which came out on Friday. Um, when my communications with the school districts, I'm also saying that this is likely, the likely disposition will be in through this next several weeks and possibly including uh, the winter holiday at the end of December. So um, I think everyone needs to settle in a bit and uh, assume this will be sort of the standard uh, going forward in the next several weeks. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I have a second question for Dr. Levine, if that's okay. Sure. Um, on, on Friday, um, Verma Digger had a small uh, story about um, cases at UVM Medical Center where staff had tested positive. They were looking at a recent group, and it noted that to date this March, there have been 79 positive cases among staff at UVM Medical Center. Um, I know that number, as of yesterday, had gone from 79 to 88 cases. Um, full disclosure, I live with a healthcare worker. Um, <laughs> the, um, the fact right now is that the, the hospital is not testing um, or having their doctors, the attending physicians, the residents, the nurses, the clinical staff, um, those people who are on the front lines are not getting tested regularly unless they experience symptoms. The only people getting tested with any regularity are the medical students because they're students. Um, and so I'm wondering, to me that seems like a big, a big hole in the system, although it would need to have to be a regular thing in order for that to be meaningful. Um, do you see it as being a priority where healthcare staff, especially given the surge that we're seeing in cases right now, start having some testing um, work into their routine? Yeah, so first of all, um, there have been cases in healthcare workers across the state. Um, I think that's testimony to the fact that <clears throat> they are in the front lines and uh, they truly um, get exposed in other ways. But I do think that if you look at them as a percentage of total healthcare workers, it's a very small number still, which is, is also testimony to how safe they try to keep themselves. 
with the use of personal protective equipment. The reality is that every um, hospital in the state had to submit a plan for testing of their staff, and that is surveillance testing, just like we're doing with the teachers. Um, and this was part of the reopening of the hospital sector and the healthcare sector um, during the whole time we were reopening one sector at a time. So there is, a, there is a plan that both that medical center and all the other hospitals in the state have uh, presented us with and are uh, supposed to be adhering to. I can obviously get a, a little look into making sure that that's been uh, adhered to to this point in time uh, because it is important. Uh, I also want to make sure it wasn't impacted in any adverse way by their cybersecurity issues. But there, there are plans uh, in place for all of the healthcare sector to be tested on a regular basis. Wow. Um, well, I know many healthcare workers who have yet to have a test. Yeah, that concerns me, so I, I, will, I will look into that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that's all for today. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Next, we'll go to Greg with the Bennington banner. Uh, greetings from Southern Vermont. Uh, this question might be for Secretary French. Um, I was wondering if I could get some clarification on the um, remote learning. Is it essentially, is that the same as a quarantine? Are we asking these students to uh, and their families to quarantine for 14 days or seven with a positive, a negative PCR test? Or are we? Is, is this really just? only about remote learning and that gets into the question of you know 14 days being two full weeks not but um but uh but nearly three school weeks so i just wonder if you can clarify the language a little bit on that yeah hi Greg. uh it's more about quarantining individual uh behaviors uh, group behaviors uh if those households multi households got together uh the remote learning is still available i think you'll see schools um make the decisions about in person or remote more based on uh, their staffing considerations and so forth. Um, but the quarantine requirement is there for the multi-household uh, social gathering. Okay. Um, while I have you on the line, Secretary, was there any thought to simply going full remote for two weeks after Thanksgiving? Um, it was, um, I was wondering if you just kind of discuss your thinking about that and whether you weighed sort of the disruption uh, that that would cause against um, sort of having a gold standard of having um, everyone at home for for two weeks. Yeah, I mean, from our and, and obviously that's not that's not academically what you want. That's not you know what you're trying to do. You're you're trying to have students in school. I understand that, but just I just wonder if you take through that. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, from our perspective, uh, you know, our team with the health department, you know, we looked at. Uh, certainly, you know, the rise in case counts and, uh, you know, considered that as an issue, but, you know, our, our data continues to support us being able to operate schools in person safely. Um, I think, you know, where this question came up about a, a holiday around your, the concept here of um, sort of continuous operation points more to staffing issues, not necessarily a reflection of the conditions of the virus. So from the, the state decision-making level, uh, I think we make those types of decisions if the conditions and the virus uh, warranted it, but they don't. Um, so we'll see individual districts address staffing issues as they have all along. Um, and we think that's, that's the best sort of, you know, say, division in terms of decision-making, letting the locals be responsive to their specific uh, staffing considerations and the state uh, keeping an eye on the health conditions. Okay, and you did say that essentially that this, this might be something that stays in place through the winter holidays? Yeah, I think certainly for the next couple of weeks, um, you know, we're watching very closely, um, you know, how the case counts go. But, you know, with the prospect of other holidays uh, coming soon, I think it's, you know, certainly weighing on our minds significantly about how to manage that. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Ed? Hello, this is Ed. Yeah, this is Ed. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my first question now pertains to uh, uh, a request that came from the uh, Glover Select Board last night uh, to the elementary school board. 
They've historically held town meetings for generations in the town hall. It's well attended. Um, with the uh, pandemic, you know, still hot. Um, they're not sure what's going to happen at March or town meeting day, but they're pretty sure that no way they'll be able to use the town hall. They'd like to use the elementary school gym as an alternative, but according to the law, because they've never used the gym before, they're not allowed to uh, to uh, move the town meeting up there, and they do not want to do remotes or Australian ballot. The governor is there perhaps a way um, because of the timing of this, they need to have a decision on a location in January. Is there something you can do through an executive order that will allow um, municipalities to be able to move over to a, a school gym uh, to be able to help enough space to accommodate everybody? Yeah, thanks for the question, Ed. I, I'm sure we'll have be having a lot of discussions about town meeting in January. I'm uh, I'm very concerned. Uh, obviously, I don't believe that the um, the, the problem, the crisis, will be solved by March. Uh, that's why I uh, promoted the fact that we we may want to go to mail-in type ballots, just as we did with the general election. Uh, I know that there's uh, been some talk within uh, legis the legislature uh, about the possibility of moving uh, town meeting day to a later date. Um, I tried that uh, uh, three or four years ago, as you might remember. It didn't go over so well, so we'll uh, we'll see how uh, how much luck the well actually it didn't go over well with the legislature. So we'll see uh, how effective uh, that is. Um, but we'll uh, we'll do whatever we can to assist. I'm not sure what prevents, uh, and, and again, uh, without getting into uh, the the law and what prevents them from having uh, that gathering in another location. But uh, we would be happy to consider that. Uh, I know the legislature will be. Uh, uh, we'll be taking a, uh, a look at that as well. So uh, please uh, make sure uh, that those uh, in your community uh, that have issues of, uh, such as this will reach out to their, uh, their legislative uh, delegation uh, so that they know what the challenges are uh, so that we can address them uh, when the legislature comes back into session. Yeah. The genesis of this came from a law that was passed a few years back, I believe it involved school shooting in which they uh, wanted to limit um, the public access, access to uh, the school and grandfathered in, you know, the, uh, the municipalities that held their town meetings uh, at the school. Uh, another question for you, I'll move to this uh, separate subject, which is, uh, we've heard a lot about Thanksgiving and Deer Camp. I haven't heard much about one of the biggest events that's going to take place uh, this month, and that's Black Friday. Do you have anything that you'd like to share there with the realtors to make sure that uh, they're not letting mobs and mobs of people yeah. in and, and uh, ignoring, you know, the social distancing, even if they wear masks? Yeah, yeah, very good point, Ed, and something we are concerned about, and we hope uh, that retailers will adhere to the guidance, uh, make sure that uh, we don't have a problem uh, after uh, after the holiday, after Thanksgiving. So. Uh, you bring up a good point, uh, and again, uh, for those uh, uh, who are listening, uh, you know, if you don't have to, it comes down to want and need. If you don't have to shop, don't. If you don't have to go out and, and uh, get into those uh, situations, don't. We're trying to prevent mass gatherings uh, of this nature for long periods of time. Um, so, uh, so really reflect on that, and, and again, to the, to the retailers, um, Please adhere to the guidance uh, that we provided and keep your customers safe. I might uh, ask Secretary Curley if there's anything uh, she'd like to offer or add to that. No, Governor, I think you nailed it. Perfect. Very good. Thank you, and happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. You too, Ed. All right. Thanks. It is 1250, and there are five folks left in the queue. We'll move to Avery, WCAX. Governor, my question goes back to compliance um, and enforcement of the guidelines. We're hearing from officials in Randolph that there's a lot of non-compliance in that community. We even uh, were forwarded a letter from the Orange Southwest School District that said that one third of the families that the district spoke with, just with con the, the families who spoke with contract tracers, just didn't care about following the rules. 
Have you heard those um, concerns from them, and what do you say to that? Yeah, I have not uh, personally heard, and I'm not saying that they haven't uh, reached out to some of the administration, but, um, you know, we'll look into it. I may ask uh, Commissioner Sherling if he's heard about that directly uh, in Randolph. Thanks, Governor. Uh, no, not specifically. Uh, as I indicated earlier, we're up around the south. Uh, health and safety assessments that have been done. Uh, so while the spreadsheet was relatively easy to sort uh, a couple of weeks ago, it's not as easy to sort uh, now with that many lines of data, but we'll, uh, we'll take a look. Thank you. Steve, NEK TV. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Um, hi, uh, I'm not sure what's going on in Clover, but uh, uh, Troy has held their uh, an annual meetings, the town meetings, in the school gymnasium, oh, for years now. But uh, I, I, I was unsure about any law that prohibited that. Um, yeah, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's specific to the to those situations because in Berlin where I live, uh, they have it in the school as well. So it's something unique uh, to the to the law. So we'll, we'll work our way through that. Uh, great, in in interesting. Um, Secretary French, uh, uh, I had a, a, another question about the mechanism of the, uh, uh, of the reporting from children about gathering. Um, uh, the, the compliance rate, when you send letters home or questionnaires home, uh, it, what the return rate is on those? And, uh, and, and, and do you recontact the uh, parents who don't return the things? And, and it doesn't, wouldn't that, uh, wouldn't that uh, have a, a, a lag time which would like diminish the whole point of this? Yeah, thanks. No, the, um, firstly, the, you know, the questionnaire we're talking about is what we call the daily health check. It's not something that's administered at the state level. It's administered on a daily basis at school district level, at school level, uh, for all students and staff. And it's really the same student person instruction. So on a daily basis, in order to enter uh, school facilities, the daily health check uh, has to be completed. It includes a number of questions pertaining to symptoms, a temperature check, uh, fairly recently an update to the travel and now um, it may include the uh, questions about multi-household gathering. So it's something that happens in real time at the school, the school level in order to uh, enter the building for the first instruction. Sure, I see. So the, the kids are questioned individually when they uh, daily. Yes, and as I was saying, in most cases, parents are completing those questionnaires uh, at home in the morning. Uh, the temperature check component still happens at the school, by school staff. I see. Thank you. Um, one for Dr. Levine, if I may. Is that your German Shepherd in the background, Steve? <laughs> uh, no, actually, it's a Jack Russell puppy. They bark for affirmation. I really have had a cat. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Dr. Levine, uh, it is we've seen a. Uh, the SARS had a confirmed fatality rate of uh, 9%, MERS was 10%. Uh, even even TB to this day has a CFR of like 15%. Um, and I've, uh, I've watched the, the CFR, the mortality rate, uh, drop precipitously uh, since the outbreak of this virus. Uh, uh, could you tell me about now, uh, at this point in time, sell up? Uh, what the uh, confirmed fatality rate is for for, uh, for this uh, virus? Sure. Um, the dog sounds extra interested in this piece of information. I will uh, have to hedge a little because there is not like a uniform number. You know, this is data from the country, the world, uh, changing all the time. I'm hearing closer to the two percent range. Uh, possibly in the twos, so between two and three percent, which is still significantly higher than, let's say, influenza. But at the same time, no matter what the number is, I regard it as very significant, obviously. 
and, and doesn't it vary very significantly by age groups? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, the 2% two, the two to 3% is an aggregate number, but if you start uh, parsing the data by uh, decades of life, et cetera, it will obviously be much higher in the very oldest. And our Vermont data bears that out as well. Okay, great. Uh, I guess that's it for me. I'll uh, use, uh, use up my time. Um, thanks, uh, Happy Thanksgiving for everybody. You too, Steve. Thank you. Keith, the Rutland Herald. Here. Go ahead, Keith. Hi, I. Hi, I was wondering um, if we had any greater clarity on why it took so much arm twisting to get several large retailers to sign up for the state's hazard pay program. And I'm also curious if their seeming reluctance or whatever it was will be accounted for uh, in the future when we design these programs or update them. Hopefully we don't have to have these uh, programs in the future, Keith, but uh, I'll let Commissioner Pichak answer. Hi, Keith, thanks for the question. So, you know, I think in a lot of the cases it was about uh, informing the large retailer about uh, the program. They just weren't aware of it. You know, obviously their employees on the ground were aware of it, but their corporate offices were not in Vermont. Maybe they were on the other side of the country and it took some time to get the information to the right uh, decision maker. Um, and then once they were aware of the program, explaining to them how it worked, how it didn't impact their business financially, how it really was designed to be solely a benefit for their employees, um, did allow them, uh, you know, to, in almost every instance to make the decision to apply. Uh, again, a lot of these companies are large bureaucratic companies. It took them a little longer to get there, uh, but at the end of the day, almost all of them did. Thank you. I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer that, but I, I think we've been, there is no, no charge for the testing. Um, Secretary Smith? That's correct, Governor. Since the beginning with our pop-ups that have been throughout the state and our new uh, sites for on-demand testing, which are uh, fairly substantial, uh, there has been no charge to uh, the individual for showing up and getting tested. Okay, thank you. Colin, seven days. Yeah, hi. I think this question might be for Secretary Smith, but um, I'm curious whether there is any concern that these surging cases will render our contact tracing um, efforts ineffective at any point. How close are we to that point? Um, at what point would that happen? Um, yeah. Yeah, we've had uh, a number of conversations uh, about this within uh, our team, and uh, we anticipated, uh, you know, when we first started seeing the rise in cases, uh, we, uh, previous to that, had had a reserve of uh, epi contact tracers uh, available to us, and we've ramped that up significantly since then, uh, have uh, even uh, reached out to uh, a number of uh, organizations, like the National Guard has provided members as well to help us out so we're in pretty good shape and we're getting in better shape as time goes on but we were you know admittedly uh, stretched uh, to our capacity uh, when we had that that big surge in the beginning uh, but we're uh, we're catching up now and we're adding uh, contact racers every single day secretary smith sure governor you uh, you hit the nail on the head here um, we expect that we'll be up to 100 for FTEs uh, by December 7th, just to give you um, some uh, indication of what FTEs we were before November, it was 23, and as we ramped up, uh, uh, we, we expect to, uh, to move uh, right up to 104 FTEs by uh, December 7th. That's next week, by, by the way, so 
Um, it's pretty well. It's uh, in a week and a day away, so it's pretty uh, substantial. And, and this is Dr. Levine, Colin. Just to add my perspective, nothing to uh, add to the numbers part, but. Um, the whole reason for your question, just for listeners, is can we continue to practice containment at the current levels of virus? And our answer from our epi section and public health is definitely yes. Um, and I need to put that in perspective for people because yesterday the CDC came out with new guidelines regarding uh, how states should prioritize their containment strategy and their contact tracing. And the reality is the country is overrun with virus right now. And so there are abundant states, including many in New England, to be honest, that have already started a prioritization scheme to uh, address the contact tracing uh, needs that they have and deficits that they have. Uh, and as the governor said, when that surge hit us, it was literally within days and it was very hard to uh, cope with that level of surge. Fortunately, things have, uh, I'll say, moderated. You know, it's not over by any means. Um, and we have all of the FTEs that the secretary just mentioned. But the CDC is really telling states uh, how to, in a organized way that makes sense for their state, uh, not do as much contact tracing as they're doing because they're unable to keep up with it. We hope to not have that situation arise here in Vermont. Thanks, all three of you, for answering that. And then just lastly, um, I mean, the question for me comes up when we see New Hampshire, where I think they decided to scale back their efforts when they had about 200 cases a day, um, which is twice what we were asked for a minute there, um, and we are half the size, but I was just curious as to whether we were nearing what they were at. But um, those numbers that we saw about what could possibly happen if people decide to gather, as they usually do for Thanksgiving, the um, 3,000 or so cases, I mean, if that were to happen, would we risk um, overwhelming our contact tracers, or is, is there any concern that we could get to that point um, if people don't um, follow the guidance? Yeah, I, I think Commissioner Petriak will agree that that was as worst a case scenario as you could draw. Um, and much like much of the projections we've had all year long, we have sort of where we expect things to go, and then we have best case and worst case scenarios. Um, so clearly, if it got to the worst case scenario, we would be in far more trouble than just our contact tracing workforce. Um, in terms of our healthcare system uh, capacity, et cetera. So that would be a, a very dire place. So if we got to the level that New Hampshire was at, we could still accommodate that very well. Um, and this gives me a great opportunity uh, to just recognize our contact tracing workforce and our members of our epi section. Uh, this has been an incredible burden on them, uh, working long hours, coming in for extra hours, et cetera. Uh, to try to keep up with this demand um, on top of managing the pandemic for this many months. So just want to recognize them as well. Thanks. All right. Governor, oh. uh, just uh, one quick question. The, uh, the incoming administration is talking about uh, perhaps a national policy towards uh, the COVID response. Uh, is that going to be sort of the broad brush that you're worried about, uh, you know? Yeah, I, I, unless they use Vermont as an example for the rest of the country, I, I, I can't imagine that we would have to do anything different than we're doing today. Uh, obviously, everything that we put into place has, has had a, a positive effect. Uh, so I, uh, I don't believe that they are going to implement anything from a broad perspective. Um, they may have triggers and so forth and advice as to, uh, to what, what should happen. But by that time, <clears throat> I would offer, I think the vaccine rollout will be well underway uh, at that point in time when the new administration uh, takes office. With that, I think that's uh, everyone. I want to wish everyone a very uh, warm and, and happy Thanksgiving. 
Um, and I do uh, hope everyone reflects on those uh, who aren't as uh, blessed as some of us are and uh, try and take care of them. As Dr. Levine had said, uh, reach out, help others um, who are disadvantaged, uh, make donations, um, do whatever you can uh, to help one another. And we'll get through this uh, one way or another. And I know this is going to be abnormal and different, um, but uh, you know we're, we're Vermont strong and uh, we'll get through this. So thank you very much and we'll see you on Friday.